So I pray for you to help us now. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, last uh, Sunday, I shared a little bit about Colleen's uh, heart condition. And you can imagine um, with uh, her heart condition, it's caused uh, Colleen and I to, uh, to look into uh, and understand the operation of the heart so much more than we ever did before. And I've got to tell you that um, the heart, when you start to study the heart, it is a marvel of God's creation. Isn't it? It's just everywhere. And, uh, you know, you look at the human body, including the heart, and you can't help but think that we have been fearfully and wonderfully made. And that comes from what psalm? Colin should know. Psalm 139, that's her favourite. Yeah, and there's a, a picture of the heart. Look at that. Uh, you know, I, was, uh, th- I couldn't believe this. I was having a look and thinking, what some of the things about the heart that are fascinating? If you make it to 70, your heart's beating about 2.5 billion times. Man, it needs a gold medal. That is amazing. <laughs> and you know, there was a lady in our church uh, last Sunday. Wasn't it lovely to see Mary Hooper? She's nearly 98. Her heart's beating about 3.2 billion times. <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? What an organ it is. And uh, it's not just like it pumps. It, it's incredible how it's been structured. It's a four-chamber. We have a four-chamber heart. What a marvel. The next photo shows you. There it is. I don't know if you can read it, but the heart has got four chambers. So it's got two top chambers that receives heart, a blood, I mean, from the lungs and from the body. And it's got they're the atriums and it's got two lower uh, chambers called the ventricles which uh, the right one pumps blood into the lung and the left one pumps blood into uh, the aorta, into the body. And uh, when, when it doesn't function well, as some of you know in, in here, we have a heart attack or we have um, heart failure. And I know a number of you have had uh, different things happen to your heart. For Colleen, it's a heart failure. Her left ventricle, the big one that pumps into her body, doesn't work well. And so as a result, it, it affects her life. Now, I was thinking about the heart. I don't want to do a biological um, sort of uh, sermon to you, but I I couldn't help but think about the heart. We looked at the heart last week as well. And uh, to me, as we come into this uh, amazing teaching by Jesus, we come across Jesus talking about the heart, not the pumping heart, but the real us. And, And he shares with us some amazing truths about our heart in regards to how we respond to God. And here we go, the number four again, four chambers of the heart. There are four different ways that humans respond to God's word, to the gospel. Do you know that? Four different ways. And we're going to see in this parable called the parable of the sower, we're going to learn about these different ways that we respond to God's message. One, we will all be in one category. Oh, it's really good to know that we can move from one category to the other. That's a good thing to know, with God's help. Now, this parable, I want you to know that is a very important parable. In Mark's Gospel, uh, Jesus said this to his disciples who didn't get the parable. In Mark chapter 4, verse 13, Jesus says, Do you not understand this parable? Then how will you understand any of the parables? So by those words, you can see that Jesus put a lot of emphasis on this parable. And, and here's two reasons why. First of all, This parable gets us to look at our own heart and to look at our own response to God's word, to the gospel. What response have we had to the gospel? What what category of heart are we in? Secondly, if we are a Christian, when we share the gospel with other people, what a great heads up to know that there are four kinds of heart that we're going to come across as we share. So that's another good thing too about this um, parable. So let's consider this parable and let us look at the four kinds of heart that exist when the gospel is proclaimed. We're going to read the parable to start with. So let's read again Luke chapter 8, uh, 4 to 8. When a large crowd was coming together and those from the various cities were journeying to him, he spoke by way of a parable. The sower went out to sow his seed And as he sowed, some fell beside the road, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky soil, and as soon as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. 
other seed fell into the good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as great. There's a parable. What do you think of this parable? Jesus is using, he's using agricultural imagery uh, to help people understand something. Um, and you've got the picture here, something that they would have understood. They never had machines back in those days. So you've got a, you've got a picture, a, a sower has a, a seed bucket and he's scattering the seed. And this seed is falling in four different places. Did you pick up on that? Four different ground types. The hard ground, the shallow ground, the thorny ground and the good ground. And only one, only the last one, produces a crop, a harvest. So what did this parable mean? We can be sure that Jesus wasn't teaching about farming. Of course he wasn't. He was teaching some very important spiritual truths. And I, I love learning this about a parable. Did anyone learn this definition of a parable? It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So we want to find out what the heavenly or spiritual meaning of this parable is. And just before I get into it, I also want to pick up on how so often we just don't get it, like the disciples. And Jesus says here in verse 8, at the end of verse 8, as he said these things, he would call out, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus said that quite often, actually. Do you know that? Do you know why he said that? Is it because we don't have ears? No, because we're not listening. We're not hearing. And we ought to know this. Like when it comes to human behaviour, we are not good listeners to each other. Have you noticed that? Yeah. yeah. That happens in marriage as well. I can't believe it. How many times Colin's telling me something and I'm distracted, I am thinking about something else and vital information has just gone right over my head. Right. Now, that we might, um, yeah, we might, not, you know, that happens. But what it is, <laughs> it also happens the other way around too. <laughs> All right. So we're not very good hearers. And, and this is especially the case, especially the case when it comes to God communicating to us. He's actually a God who communicates and most people are not hearing him or listening to him. Now, I'm going to read out of one of my favourite Old Testament books, Jeremiah. Listen to God's heart as he shares this. Um, he's speaking through the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 7, 25 and 26. Since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day, that's a long time, I have sent you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising early and sending them, yet they did not listen to me or incline their ear but stiffen their neck. And it's like that's, that's what God's issue with humans has been for a long time. And then we come into the New Testament and it's going to happen again. That is why Jesus quite often, quite regularly said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Listen to God. Listen. And how we need to listen, especially to Jesus, because Jesus is the truth. He has the truth. And that truth is glorious. This, this truth is so critically important for us to be saved and to, for us to be going to heaven. We must listen to him. He alone has the words of eternal life. And um, yeah, so I, I want us to make sure with God's help, let's listen well today. Let's listen to the Holy Spirit. That's who speaks to us. Let's not shut him out, but let us listen to him. And by the way, I'm so glad that the disciples didn't get this parable because Jesus explained it to them, which means we get the explanation of the parable. That's in verse 9. His disciples began questioning him as to what this parable meant. And then in verses 11 onwards, we have what the parable meant, the spiritual meaning of the parable. So I'm going to start off by now reading uh, Luke chapter 8, and we're going to go to verse 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. All right? So that's what Jesus wants you to picture. The seed is the word of God. And I want you to uh, pick up on this parable. In this parable, we know that there's no fault with the seed, is there? The seed's good. Depends what ground it falls in. And I want to say, just like the word of God, 
There's no fault in the Word of God. Isn't that lovely to know that? The Word of God is inspired by God. It's God-breathed. It is absolutely true. It's absolutely reliable. It's even eternal. This is the Word of God. It's good. Let me read a few verses to you. In Isaiah chapter 40, great chapter, verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. What a word. John chapter 17, verse 17. In our home groups, we've considered this verse. Well, some of us, if we're up to, up to it. Um, it says there, Jesus says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. The whole of God's word is truth. Wow, what a word. And not only that, this word that is eternal, that is full of truth, it is truth, it is able, like that seed in the story, is able to impart life to us. That's exciting, isn't it? This book, the words of God, are able to impart life to us. Just like that little seed could impart life and bring forth a crop, God's word is able to impart spiritual an abundant life, an eternal life to us, to all who will receive his word. I love the picture language. Right, and I'm going to read to you now another verse. James, I love this one. James chapter 1, verse 21. In humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. That's how critically important it is to understand what we have, the word of God, the gospel, and that we make sure it is planted into our heart. So now we're going to look at the four kinds of heart that God finds as his gospel goes out to all the people of the world. There are only four different kinds of heart. So the first one is mentioned in Luke chapter 8, verse 12, where Jesus is now going away from the agricultural imagery and he wants us to learn what that means uh, spiritually. So let me read verse 12. Those beside the road are those who have heard that the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. What kind of heart do these people have? Jesus is describing people with a hard heart. A hard heart. Just as some seed in the parable landed on hard ground... The gospel, unfortunately, lands in people's hearts that are hard. So it never penetrates. It doesn't go down into their heart. Uh, When it comes to hard ground, Jesus is picturing along the paddock, uh, the sum of the seed, when it scattered, fell upon, upon ground that has been hardened by human traffic, by humans walking along that path, and it's hard. And so the seed just sits on the top and then people are walking on that seed and then the birds come and pluck it out, pluck it and eat it. You know, what a picture this is. I I can't help but think of this. I can develop a hard heart when I allow human traffic to come over me. What I mean by that is where I am listening to worldly wisdom, to human philosophy, to human religion, And all those things, all those things have a tendency to harden my heart to God's glorious truth. So what am I listening to? Am I listening to the world? Am I listening to human philosophy? Am I listening to other religions? Because all those things have a tendency to harden your heart. So I need to be careful of what I'm allowing uh, to trample me. And I know there are other reasons why we can have a hardened heart too. Like I know that there are horrible circumstances we go through and and some people, they just repel the gospel. They can't make sense of their circumstances. Other people have had terrible religious experiences or whatever it might be and our hearts become hardened and we reject and even rubbish the gospel and we dismiss it and discard it. I remember kids at school when they were getting a Gideon's Bible. You know, I got my Bible. I'm not a Christian yet, but I, I have respect for God's word. They, they just thought it was a great joke to see how far they could throw it. Talk about rejecting and discarding. You know, they just throw in it. have no idea. They just think it's a load of rubbish. They've got a hard heart. 
What a tragedy. What a tragedy. The gospel alone can save us and give us eternal life. But when we have a hard heart, when we reject it, we cannot be saved. And not only that, Jesus tells us that uh, the, the picture language is, is that like the birds come and eat that seed, uh, the devil, because of our choice, the devil will come and take away that good seed, the gospel, so that we cannot be saved. It's not the devil's. We can't blame the devil. It's us. We've chosen to have a hard heart. So as we go through these different hearts, we need to consider ourselves. I need to consider myself. Uh, do, do we have a hard heart? Many do. And we might think, oh, yeah, the atheist and people like that. No, no. There are people in church with a hard heart. Wow, that's, that's something. How can that be? Well, friends, it happens. There are people who go to church where church is just like a club thing. They just come and they, they come here, but they are hard. They have a hard heart when it comes to the gospel. They're not moved. Are you like that? They're not moved as they read about their own sin, as, as, as God convicts them of their own sin. They're not moved by God's incredible grace and favour to us. They are unmoved. They have a hard heart. They don't get so caught up in the goodness and grace of God. Do you have a hard heart? Here's a little thing I'd say to you. Oh, may God give you the heart of a guy in the Old Testament called King Josiah. When he heard God's word being read to him, his heart was warm and responsive. It says of him that his heart was tender and he humbled himself before God. May that be the heart we all have. Don't have a hard heart. Let's consider the second kind of heart in regard to a person's response to the gospel. And that's in verse 13. Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no firm root. They believe for a while, and in time of temptation, fall away. So what kind of heart does this person have? I'm going to call it a shallow heart. So some of the seed uh, landed on shallow ground. It's just got a, a thin layer of topsoil, and underneath is, um, is rock. Um, and sometimes that's what happens. The gospel is scattered upon human hearts and some people have a shallow heart. The gospel cannot enter well and take root. That's the key. That, it doesn't take root. Do you, do you love the picture language here? Wow, so there are a, a large number of people like this. In shallow ground, the seed will sprout. It will be full of life for a bit, but it soon but it soon dies when growing conditions become tough because there's not enough soil for the roots to get down. There's not enough moisture in that, in that thin layer of soil and when it's a bit drier, when it's windy, it doesn't take long before that, that little plant uh, withers away. So how does this relate to people with a shallow heart? Well, people can receive the gospel with joy. Who doesn't want to have their sin forgiven? Who doesn't want to go to heaven? Yeah, I'm going to say yes to that. But here's the interesting thing. They never really develop root in Jesus in the gospel. So, and it shows itself. So when people begin to mock you and ridicule you for your faith, when challenging trials come upon your life, you turn away from Jesus because you sign up for not the Christian life, but the easy life. And so as trials come, we end up turning away from Jesus. Sometimes these people leave church. Other times they actually remain in church. We might have people today with a shallow heart. And what do they look like? They are people who are un committed. They actually are not following Jesus. In fact, they're like a chameleon. In the world, they act worldly. In the church, they act churchy, whatever that is. All right. They have no root. 
they don't really know Jesus. Wow, what a tragedy. They've never taken the time to grow in Christ and know him. And they might call Jesus Lord. There's a passage on this in Matthew 7. They might uh, do, you know, do all that, but Jesus will say one day to them, you know those words, Matthew 7, 23, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And for them, the key thing is, I never knew you. You were just in it for what you can get. You weren't in it to know me. Right, so we need to look at our own lives. Am I, do I have a shallow heart? First of all, I need to realise I'm not saved yet. And I might call Jesus Lord and I might sing the songs of the faith, but I don't know Jesus yet. And that's a serious thing. And so my appeal to you, if you're in that category, are the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. These are the words that cause me to be saved. And Jesus says, If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever gives up his life for me will find life. What will it profit you if you gain the whole world and forfeit your soul? They are very important words. Right now we're going to move on to the next kind of heart. So Jesus describes this in verse 14. So let me read verse 14. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard and as they go on their way, they are, uh, they are choked. On their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. All right, so what kind of heart is this? I'm going to call it the thorny heart. Now, we're not talking in the sense of a person being uh, thorny and prickly in their character. We're talking about being thorny in relation to their response to the gospel. And what Jesus is describing here is a person whose heart is full of thorns and weeds. In other words, other things, other things that are in their life that choke, that strangle God's word. And some things are mentioned here by Jesus. The worries of the world, riches and pleasures. So we can have other things in our life that become the dominant thing in our life. And some of these things might be good, but... Actually, what it is, is this what we're living for? It might be uh, a person in our life. It might be um, our career. It might be sporting achievements. It might be our possessions. It might be our pleasures. But all these things, this is, this is the most serious one of all this heart. This is so common. We have other things in our heart and we're not true to Jesus. He isn't the one we love the most. He is second. He's like insurance policy, just in case. But we're actually doing our own thing, living our own life. Oh, they're the kind of Christians we say, one foot in the world and one foot in the church. The gospel has never taken, taken hold of their life where their life has been transformed. And, it's, and you see it, it, it shows itself to be, to, that they are Christians, that they are bearing the fruit. Okay, so... As I'm sort of making clear, so far, all three cases of, of each heart, I want you to be clear about this, that they are not Christians. Definitely the heart are, but so are the others. They're not Christians. They're not saved. They're not born again. They're not going to go to heaven. Jesus gives us his parable so that we can look at our heart. This is such an important parable. What kind of heart do we have? Now, in terms of the thorny heart, one day Jesus will say to those people, those words I've already quoted. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And I want to highlight the, that last bit. You who practice lawlessness, or as the Australian way we would say, you who do your own thing. That's what they're up to. They're just doing their own thing. And if you're into that, just doing your own thing, really ruling your own life, doing what you want, then you're not there yet. And that's a serious thing to, to be close but not there yet. And so what would I say to you? I would say to you one word. Repent. That is the cry of the gospel. Jesus cries it out. Repent. 
Turn away from that. Turn away from any other love, any idol in your life, any sin you're still wanting to do. Turn away from it and take hold of Jesus and make him everything. In Acts chapter 17, verse 30, the Apostle Paul declares, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to all people everywhere that they should repent. So people who don't repent are going to be in this category of having a thorny or weedy heart. And now we come to the fourth category, and that's in verse 15. And we read there, But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart, and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. Like the good ground that takes that seed and from that seed comes life and, and a crop is born. Uh, the good heart takes God's word into their heart. The gospel comes into their heart. It's planted and it grows and it shows itself by fruit being born. Notice how Jesus describes this heart that bears fruit being an honest heart and a good heart. It's an honest heart. What does Jesus mean by having an honest heart? You own up to the fact that we have failed God, that we ha I, I have sinned against God. I'm honest. I'm honest about that. I cannot make it to heaven on my own. I'm honest about that. And I have a good heart. That is not a hard heart, not a shallow heart, not a thorny heart. Now, here's a big thing. I was thinking through this parable. No human being, none of you, none of, I haven't, were born with an honest and good heart. Oh, no, now we're all in trouble. That's true. None of us have an honest and good heart. We're not honest. We're not good. We know that pretty soon, you know. Two years of age, three years of age, already making waves, doing stuff we shouldn't be doing. At two, it just gets worse. In Jeremiah... Here, here, this, oh, this verse just knocks me for six. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. God says, The heart is more deceitful than anything else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? That is God's verdict of the human heart. So there's no hope for us? No, there is hope. Because there is an awesome God who loves us and cares for us. So the good heart in verse 15 is actually the person who has allowed God to do some work, big work, in their life. And in there, they realise they're a sinner. They realise that they're not right with God. And they have a broken and contrite spirit. God has helped them to get to that place. They even cry out like in Psalm 51 verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And God enables our heart to become honest and then he helps our heart to become good, taking away the hardness, taking away uh, the shallowness, taking away those thorns so that the word of God, the gospel, comes into my heart and it does the most amazing thing. First of all, I'm forgiven of all my sins. I'm made right with God. I am saved. I am empowered by the Holy Spirit. My life begins to change. I am transformed like we heard about those people in the Palawan. Fantastic. This is the only kind of heart where a person is truly saved and will be in heaven one day. So the big question is, is not, do I have an honest and good heart? The big question is, has God, have, do, have I known the work of God in my life to bring me to a place where I'm honest before God and I have a good heart to open myself to him fully and allow his word to come into my life, to, for Jesus to come into my life and to take root in me. And because of how precious it is to me, I will persevere no matter what. I will never let go of Jesus. He's everything to me. Does that describe your heart? Well, what will happen is that seed that's gone into you, Jesus who's come into you, he will bear fruit in you. 
and that fruit will be beautiful. You'll become more like Jesus. You'll bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You will not look like a worldly person, but a person who's in touch, who walks with Jesus. And that's my prayer for all of us, that we might be a people who have an honest and good heart. Where, as it says in um, verse 8, where we're producing a crop a hundred times as great. Man, that is, that is miraculous, actually. No normal crop produces a hundred times as great, but that's what God can do. And, uh, you know, when I think about this, this uh, month we're looking at mission, this is the heart of mission, having a right heart and where I, am, I, I have an honest heart and a good heart and the word of God is having impact upon my life and I am about his kingdom. I'm about his mission, not about Ian's mission, not about Ian's kingdom, not about Ian's will, but God's kingdom and God's will. And I'm going to do everything I can till I enter heaven to support mission and to do mission. This is the heart I pray for all of us to have. So let's just go through this. Do we have a hard heart? There are going to be some probably here today who do. There's no response to God's word. It's very limited. Do you have a shallow heart? That's common. You just don't allow God to come deep into your heart and change you. Do you have a thorny heart? You, you've deliberately allowed things in your life to remain there that just chokes all that God could do. You haven't repented. Or do you have the honest and good heart? Can you see why this parable is so important? It's Jesus. He's speaking to our heart. He's wanting us to analyse, where am I? And how good it to know if we have a hard heart, a shallow heart, a thorny heart, God is able to move you to the good heart. I am so glad about that. So praise the Lord for what he can do. I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna, going to sing our closing song. Being Mission Month, I thought it'd be nice, and especially after reading about the good and honest heart, we're going to sing that lovely song, Let Your Kingdom Come.
me pray. Our Father, thank you for that song that we just sang. And I know that um, there's no way that we can really mean that song unless we have been blessed to have an honest and good heart. And that's the heart we want. We want to be saved. We want to be going to heaven. We want to know Jesus. And we want to be engaged uh, in his kingdom and his work. So Lord, for any of us who aren't there yet, I pray for you to, to speak to our soul and to help us to come to that place where we, we are humble and honest before you and where we open our heart fully to your son Jesus and his word coming into our life. Please would you save us truly. And uh, if we're in the shallow ground, if we're in the thorny ground, please, Lord, help us to see that we're in a bad state. Even if we come to church, even if we uh, think we're a Christian, but we, we sort of know there's something not right, please would you help us. So I pray, Lord, I pray with all my heart that you would help all of us to make sure that we have transitioned into that right place and that it would show that our lives would bear fruit that we would, it would show that we uh, love your son and we are living for him. And I, I just want to ask, Lord, that you would help us, that it would be seen because we are engaged in mission. We do want to share the gospel. We want to have boldness to speak so that other people can hear about your son. Help us, Lord, to be about your kingdom. Thank you, Father, for this time we've had together. Thank you for Elise sharing with us this morning as well. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.